So this semester we're going to be studying biology and so we need to start really at the very beginning in understanding what is biology and quite simply it's the study of life. But to get a little deeper we have to ask ourselves what is life? And that's at once a kind of simple question but also a really complicated question. If you think about things that you know to be alive, for example, yourself, your cat, your dog, the tree outside of your window, those are all very easily things that you know to be life. And just as easily you probably know that a rock is not alive, a chair is not alive, uh, asphalt's not alive, and on and on. Um, but of course scientists love to be really specific, they love to make lists, um, and so we need to have a really clear definition for life. And those definitions are going to include all the things we think of as living for the most part. And then there's going to be some things like viruses that are going to end up, as we'll realize later on in the semester, not quite fitting these definitions. So let's take a look at the criteria that scientists have established that define life. So the first one of these is cells and organization. Living things are very organized. They maintain um, very specific ordered pieces um, and at the most obvious to you probably things like organs. We all have two lungs um, or we should have two lungs and two kidneys and two arms and two legs um, and this is kind of really obvious order but we're also very ordered all the way down to the lowest level. And the cell in particular is a unit within living things um, and if you look at living things, they're all fundamentally built out of cells. And what's really special about cells is that in an organism like ourself that has many cells, we can take that cell out of our bodies and actually that cell itself is alive. So for example, I could take a, a piece of your skin, take it out of you, a little sample from out of you, put it into food like sugar solution, and those cells would stay alive. So the cell in and of itself is able to maintain life. So that's what makes cells so special and why throughout the semester we'll talk a lot about cells specifically. Another criteria for life is energy use and, and metabolism. And again, another subject that we'll talk about later on in the semester is that this order that we have in living things is not the way of the universe. The way that the universe is, is that everything goes towards disorder. So things fall apart, basically. And so living things are going to have to use energy to stay very organized, to not fall apart. So, of course, where do we get energy from? Well, it just doesn't come from anywhere. We have to eat it um, or produce it from the sun um, in chemical reactions. Uh, and these chemical reactions are called metabolism. And this is another huge topic that we're going to talk about over the course of the semester. A third feature of living things is the ability to interact with the environment. Um, and in particular, this is focused on the individual. So, you know, you know this very simply as if you reached out your hand and you were going to touch a flame, you would, if you felt that flame, you would immediately pull your hand back from that flame because you're responding to that environment and that's going to help you survive. The example here in the picture from your textbook is um, showing a plant and you can see that this plant is curving towards this open window. So this plant is responding to a low level of light and moving towards where there's high light. And again, this is something that organisms, living things, can do. Another feature of living things is regulation and homeostasis. Regulation is um, the ability to control things in our body um, so that we can maintain homeostasis. And homeostasis is maintaining internal conditions. So the example that most people really understand with this and they already know about is body temperature. You know that we're warm-blooded organisms and so is the bird that's pictured here. And because of that, we have a specific body temperature that we need to maintain. That's our homeostasis is at that correct body temperature, 98.6 or whatever it is, um, for us. And so 
the regulation piece of it is how we're going to get to that homeostatic condition. And so again, if you think about body temperature, if you're cold, if your temperature is dropping, you're going to start shivering. That's that regulation. Regulation kicks in to get your body shivering so that you can get your temperature back up. And same thing if your temperature is going too high, you have a regulation process that will get your temperature back down to your homeostatic condition. And again, this is something that living things are capable of. Um, and I just want to reiterate that all living things are capable of this, not just warm-blooded ones. The warm-blooded example is just one that we really click with, but you probably know from experience that there's lots of non-warm-blooded animals like lizards, um, for example. But they have lots of other things that they maintain at homeostasis. For example, the concentration of salt in their blood or the concentration of acid in their blood. Those are things that uh, all organisms, even the simplest organisms, cold-blooded organisms, are also part of their homeostasis. Um, so again, not just warm-blooded animals. All right, moving on here, we've got growth and development. So again, something you're going to see in living things, you don't have baby rocks, you have baby turtles, right? So, oh, Wrong one, never mind. Uh, that was, I was getting ahead of myself and talking about reproduction. Oh, well, no, growth and development also applies here. Sorry, guys. Um, so growth and development, you don't have baby rocks that grow up to be bigger rocks. Um, and so um, growth is really a feature of, um, of living things. So growth will produce more cells, it will produce larger cells. Um, and again, a feature of living things. Development's a little bit different. Development is um, changing and developing specific characteristics. And so if you, again, sort of linking to a human example, um, the time that we carry out development primarily is in utero. We go from being a very simple cell, right, that doesn't look very much like a human, to developing into these complex shapes and features, these arms, these legs, um, and all the different parts that will make us human. And that's a developmental process. So development is more like changing structures, not just bigger in size. So if you think about it, there's one other time in our lives when we also carry out development in our bodies. And if you think about it for a second, maybe you can think about it. What other time in our life do we carry out development? And that time is puberty. So Things aren't just getting bigger in puberty, we're not just growing taller, we also start developing features that we did not have as children, and so that's growth and development. Okay, so reproduction that I really wanted to jump to earlier. So obviously kind of connected, and that's why I sort of had that little um, brain fart. Um, <laughs> but reproduction is another feature of life. So again, you don't have baby rocks. You don't have a mama rock and a baby rock, right? Um, but, uh, and so rocks just like, they just eventually disintegrate. They have no way to perpetuate themselves. Um, but reproduction is important to maintaining life over many generations. And one of the things that goes along with reproduction is genetic material. So in order to reproduce, we have to have the instructions for life. That's what the genetic material is. Um, and so when there's a reproductive event, the genetic material is used to make a new cell or to make a new organism. And so the other thing about reproduction that, again, I'm sure you already know, is that offspring tend to have the traits of their parents. And this is um, a huge topic that we'll spend a lot of time on as well, not about like sexual reproduction, but about how cells reproduce um, and also inheritance of traits. So that's a little something to look forward to later on in the semester. Okay, the last trait here that's really important for defining life is biological evolution. And bio biological evolution is the ability of living things um, to change over many generations. So sometimes people get this confused with the response to environment because they've all, most people have heard that evolution is when organisms evolve to survive in their environment. And the really key difference between environmental changes that I just want to re reiterate is that when we talk about response to environmental changes, we're talking about an individual. So we are talking here about a single plant bending towards this window. This is not a plant evolving to live next to a window. Okay, that kind of sounds goofy if you think about it. This plant is not evolving. It's just 
growing towards the window, and if I turned this plant tomorrow, it would turn back the other direction. So it's not something that's long-lived, it's not permanent. And what we say is it's not heritable, that means it can't be passed on, whereas biological evolution is going to be heritable changes, things that can be passed on to offspring. The other key difference that goes along with that is that it's not an individual. This is an individual plant bending towards light. Evolution is when groups of organisms change. So you don't just go from having one organism that has a feature, you go to having many organisms that tend to have this new feature. Um, so that key word here is populations of organisms. The other key thing that's really important to understand biological evolution is that it's change over vast periods of time. This response to environmental changes, it could be instantaneous, one second. Biological evolution is millions of years. Um, and this is, is driven sometimes by environment, not always. It is can be driven by environment, but it's overall about survival and reproductive success so that organisms will evolve to have traits that, and here's the environment connection, many times helps them survive in particular environments better. So these are the traits of living things. And again, this gives us a very formal definition for what is alive. So here's that list again of the defining characteristics of life. And so again, this is um, the way that we could ask ourselves about things that might be a little more ambiguous. So my question here for you is that, is a bunch of celery at the grocery store alive? And this is a little bit tricky, right? Because it was alive, right? It was a plant. I've cut it down and I've sent it to the grocery store. Um, and so, uh, how would you test this? This is a little bit for you to think about, thinking about these defining characteristics of life.